And thanks everybody. We're really excited to be here today. Uh, as Stephen said, this is our first engagement with the Cloud Field Day and Tech Field Day community, but you know, we're very excited to uh, introduce Diamante to a whole new set of people because we're doing some really interesting and fun things. A uh, quick introduction. My name is Jenny Fong. Um, I started my career actually at VMware and I feel like I've been at the forefront of this industry as we move from virtual machines to containers as my next hop was over to lead product marketing at Docker. I joined Diamante at the beginning of this year uh, and partly what it drew me to this company was the exciting things that were on the roadmap, which we'll share today, which is uh, part of our schedule, which is Diamante Spectra 3.0. But before we get into that, just so you know where to get more information, we have our website at diamante.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at diamante.com or my own Twitter is techgaljenny. So what the agenda looks like for today is, I'm gonna just do a quick overview of the Diamante company, our background, what our platform looks like. Then I'm gonna hand things over to all the great technical resources that we have in our team. So we'll go deeper dive into our storage architecture and data services, which are really key differentiating services for us. And then we'll talk about this new release that just came out last month, Diamante Spectre 3.0. Uh, and we'll also share a demo of that. So let's get started. And who is Diamante? So the origins of Diamante go back to the UCS days at Cisco. Uh, a team of industry veterans got together to build that original UCS um, server. And you know they came from companies like Veritas, VMware, Brocade, et cetera. But in 2013, they recognized, actually ahead of the curve, that the fundamental application paradigm was shifting. The move to cloud-native application designs meant that traditional legacy server architectures were going to be pushed to their maximum uh, when supporting a lot of these new scale out distributed apps. And so they left Cisco to create Diamante. And I say ahead of the curve because you see that Docker, Kubernetes, all of that really momentum really started in 2014 and beyond. But they already saw that this shift was happening. Another important piece of what was happening in the market around that time is that AWS actually started introducing their Nitro instances. And this is gonna be key when we talk about our storage architecture, but it's basically the concept of offloading the IO from the CPU and these uh, external PCIe cards. And so you saw that AWS introduced Nitro first to get better bandwidth. And then later on, they added also storage capabilities that technology was really to help them optimize their own environment so that they can serve up their customers. Uh, what we haven't really seen in the market is companies that built, developed this technology to serve the buyers and the builders of data centers. And so this is happening in the background. Um, and the Kubernetes community is getting started. And so one of the first things that the founding team of, of Diamante really got involved in was the creation of the Flex Volume plugin. Before then, every single storage plugin was a, you know, a custom plugin that had to get integrated into the core Kubernetes project. In 2016, um, Diamante helped contribute that Flex Volume plugin that gave every, a common way for people to interface into Kubernetes. And that really served as sort of the precursor to today's CSI interface. Uh, we also contributed the scheduler extensions to extend Kubernetes out. Um, and in 2017, we introduced the first hyperconverged bare metal platform that incorporates that IO acceleration uh, offload technology. And we're gonna go well deep into what that means. Since then, we've been basically growing our business. Um, and then this year, what we also introduced is uh, Spectra 3.0, which is federated Kubernetes for stateful apps. So what we'll show you today is, you know, our core technology and what we were founded on was uh, as basically an appliance solution. Uh, but with our most recent release, we have really invested heavily in our software stack to deliver 
an enterprise-ready Kubernetes platform for hybrid cloud. So again, the Diamante platform today is a combination of a you know, leading Kubernetes management platform with software included and a modern HCI solution. It's based on a bare metal uh, platform. It includes high performance NVMe storage and our patented IO acceleration technology. And again, our team that is after me will go well deeper into what this platform looks like. The real challenges that we were setting out to solve are twofold. Uh, the first is this transition to Kubernetes is happening super fast. However, uh, it's still very difficult for companies who are trying to build their own solutions to really get up to production scale with you know, do-it-yourself projects. And so one of the ideas behind a fully integrated software and hardware platform is the concept of uh, helping people adopt these new DevOps processes and cloud native architectures without having to worry about the infrastructure underneath. The other issue is the demand. Um, as I mentioned, the founders of the company saw how the new application architectures were gonna really stretch the ability for the traditional server architectures to support all of that, uh, you know, IO traffic and um, east-west traffic and ingress traffic. So our approach here is instead of having to select your hardware, select your components, build it all together, make sure it works together. We have a fully ready to go appliance that you can plug into your top of rack switch and have a enterprise grade Kubernetes environment up and running inside your data center. Now, of course, this is inside your data center. I mentioned our new release also extends out to hybrid cloud. So you'll hear more about how we also help to embrace cloud-based Kubernetes resources. So our advantages overall, uh, it's very simple because it is that HDI-based approach. We really try to take all that great technology that's in the open source community, package it up, make it easy to run, easy to operate inside the data center. We have that IO acceleration technology that really drives high efficiency and uh, greater performance. And we have some great numbers we can share about that. And having a secure full stack approach, which is all the way from software to hardware. Jenny, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned uh, at the very beginning, uh, the fact that you started with the HCI and now the latest version is more multi-cloud, okay? But can I start with your solution from the, from the cloud and then later implement uh, the uh, on-premises part or, uh, or is it just that, that I have to start with the HCI uh, platform first? That's a good question. Um, today with Rio, it is still the model where we, we are providing these new services to our existing customers. So it is HCI first extend to public cloud. Um, down the road, we are looking at how do we actually enable the domain. You'll, you'll learn about the domain controller stack, but uh, we doing that in the other order. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, also, Jenny, um, I saw a couple of times you mentioned that uh, it's uh, your solution is mostly bare metal cloud based. So, yes. is is 100% bare metal, or do you also have a virtualized version as well? Uh, so, with this release and, and some of the things we're doing, we are supporting virtualized infrastructure. So, most cloud based infrastructure is VM based, uh, and so we are able to manage clusters uh, that are delivered on virtual machines. The appliance solution, if you uh, want it the out of the box solution, it comes from Diamante as a bare metal platform. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in this diagram though, you see there's a VM there. And one of the things that we are able to do with our platform is uh, support virtual machines inside containers. So. That is something one of our customers is doing uh, the, in production and we're leveraging some of the, the built-in technologies to support that. So this is just another look of our platform. Um, you can kind of see the multiple layers that we have here. Uh, we have the management control plane, which is where we add our you know, enterprise grade security, our back um, and the dashboard. 
and you'll get a good look at what that dashboard looks like today. Uh, the next layer down, you have, you know, just plain open source components around Docker, a certified Kubernetes distribution running on CentOS. Between that and the hardware though, uh, we do have our own CSI plugins that are NCNI plugins. And this is to me, one of our key differentiators because uh, rather than not caring about that layer in between software and hardware, we actually leverage our insight at the software level to make the hardware better. And so this is where we have some really great ways to optimize um, and the performance of applications because we have that full stack approach with how we handle storage and networking. Um, those IO offload cards, as I mentioned, we'll get into more detail of. And then again, the underlying uh, x86 server models, which have NVMe. Uh, one thing to note on the, on the hardware, uh, we do have our own basically, you know, um, x86 hardware, uh, but we're also leveraging some partnerships uh, with Dell and Lenovo that can help companies uh, basically utilize their existing server uh, vendor relationships. So on the Ultima side, again, uh, we have uh, two cards right now, um, that a separate storage card and a separate networking card, both of them are PCIe based. On the storage side, uh, one, and, and uh, my next speaker will go into this in very big detail, but it's uh, basically we have some key contributions here around how we can handle not just performance, but also uh, consistency and quality of service, as well as data services. So things like backups and, and snapshots and disaster recovery. Um, he'll go into a lot more detail into here, so I'm not gonna spend as much time, but I do wanna just wrap up with some of the hardware options we have. The uh, hardware, if you wanna get it from Diamante right now, we actually have a D20 family and a D20X family. I, I don't have the D20 sharing, but uh, basically those are our, you know, our standard offerings, which are using the latest Intel Xeon um, processors. When you select an appliance, you do select a size, small, medium, large, which includes different core accounts, memory, and NVMe storage. It is an HCI model, so it's completely scalable uh, and modularly scalable. In addition to the D20, D20X, we have a GPU supported uh, set of options. You'll see here that there's a T version and a P version. Uh, as you guys are aware in your training models, you kind of need the full horsepower of a, a, a GPU. But when you have your model and you're just running it in production, um, the need for that goes down. So we have two different models here, one to support that heavy training and one to support production or the inference. Uh, Jenny, I, I have a question about the different hardware models and sort of sure. mixing them. Because um, one of the things that I've run into with HCI solutions in the past is all of the nodes in a specific cluster all have to be the same configuration in order to expand them. Do you have that same limitation with this or can you sort of mix and match within the same cluster? Um, I know we can manage different clusters. I will actually see if... Um... Boris, if you can answer that question and unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, hi everybody, this is Boris. Um, so yes, you can actually 100% mix and match any of our offerings within the same cluster or across clusters, uh, which does give you the really you know, needed power of look for some things I need less resources and for some things I wanna target on beefier hardware. Uh, we recognize the same problem with other solutions. So yes, you can 100% mix and match in any way, shape or form you want. Okay, and I could use something like tainting or, or something similar to that to do node selection? Correct, yeah. We, we have our scheduler that's fully integrated and um, we're not doing anything to prohibit you from essentially just uh, using affinity, anti-affinity labeling, however you decide to attack the problem as far as managing your zoning, regioning, uh, everything else. We do extend some things. Um, Abe will kind of describe our uh, hardware contribution to, to the whole stack that, that require annotations, but everything else that Kubernetes does is um, exactly how you would experience it anywhere else. Okay, great, thanks. 
Yep. yep. And he reminded me, we actually, um, you know, one of our customers was interested in mixing GPU instances or appliances with non GPU for the matter of having, you know, easier administration, right? You don't want to have too many clusters to manage. And so they wanted to be able to have both uh, options in the same cluster. And Jenny, uh, what is the minimal configuration and do you support for edge use cases? I mean, particular hardware that is uh, efficient in terms of power consumption and things like that? Um, so a minimum configuration for us is three nodes and that's for fault tolerance purposes. Uh, you know, we'll get into the storage architecture, but for us to have, you know, uh, ability to survive, uh, have that high availability, uh, it is three nodes minimum. Um, I think the second part of your question is about the power. Yeah, power consumption. I mean, uh, you, you provide your hardware, but can I buy, purchase my uh, hardware and can you certify it if necessary to, to get, you know, the best power consumption or any other, you know, uh, requirement that I have specifically for my environment. I'll have to turn that one back to Boris again. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I'm going to answer this slightly roundabout. Um, we do not give you the ability to modify, you know, the, uh, the choice of power supplies. However, we do, we're, we're not in the business of building uh, servers, right? We're in the business of extending Kubernetes. So we rely on Intel and Dell and HP and Lenovo, all of which we have uh, relationships and they supply the hardware for us, which then means that we get to tap into their entire supply chain and skew process. So it, now that we are partners with them, it's very easy to go, okay, uh, a client is looking at a specific platform that they really like that has the right you know, power consumption. Uh, and then we can go through the certification process for that and offer it as a, um, as a build platform for Diamante. Okay. Um, we, we come with a default set that we have certified based on, you know, discussion with each supplier, uh, but they all provide the same kind of base core count, RAM count, NVMe count. Um, and you know, the, the power slightly fluctuates depending on, depending on the, uh, platform chosen. Okay. So kind of as a follow on to that one, Boris, is, is it truly t-shirt sized? Is it, you know, for a small, you get this many cores, this much memory, this much storage, or is there a mix and match within that? Uh, so you can buy, uh, as the, the minimum number is only bound by, um, etcd which means that you can buy one small node one medium node and one extra large node and run all three of them as your cluster we we don't really care you can buy all three being smalls or all three being extra larges uh it truly is a mix and match in whatever shape or form you want uh, we, we're only bound by by math as far as what you know kubernetes relies for uh, for ha and dr I have a question on earlier sure. what you said. If we are covering it later, we could leave it later. But uh, you mentioned about the fact that uh, you efficiently optimize and manage both CPU and GPU clusters. So is that uh, dynamic, meaning depending on my workload, for example, if I have some of the HPC workloads, uh, that would require majority GPU or all GPU, uh, and probably some of the model creation work if I do AI or ML model creation, then probably I would need more of G uh, GPU. But if I were to use it for inference or some other light workloads, I might need more CPU. Uh, first of all, who decides how it is optimized, whether it's cost, power, combination thereof? How do I do that combination? Second, that optimization, is it automatic? How do I, how do I get best out of it? Uh, this is, kind of goes back to the, what Boris described, right? So as a consumer of the, the service, uh, you probably will want to use certain labels to identify which nodes that you wanted to operate on. So there's a little bit of a handshake there between the you know, app owner and the uh, operator on that. Okay, so I get to choose when I'm defining it, the cluster wise, uh, give me a cluster of this, give me a cluster of that, or a combination thereof, I get to choose. Yeah, and, and Boris, if you wanted to add more color. Yeah, uh, so in the same cluster that has, say, two GPU nodes and five regular nodes, mm -hmm. um, essentially the Kubernetes scheduler uh, 
does the decision making for you. It, if you are passing in a GPU workload, it knows to target the GPU nodes automatically. Okay. And it also gives you the ability to target a directly a specific node uh, if you wanted to. So say you had a training node and a production node, yep. that, you know, one is going to crunch numbers, the other one is going to just, you know, uh, actually run the algorithms or, or you want to target the CPU nodes. It's all entirely built in through the, the scheduler. It's, it's smart enough. It will look at resources. If you have multiple GPUs, you will find the one that's not busy. Uh, so all of that kind of uh, brain teasing is uh, is done automatically for you, and it okay. gives you tools to manually customize how and where you want to place workloads. Okay, great, thanks. Okay. So, as I said, this is the last slide. Um, I just wanted to close on. You know, we talk about our performance advantages, and this is a pretty critical differentiation because what we're seeing in the market is more companies want to containerize and operate a lot of these data intensive applications, right? With things like Elasticsearch and Kafka and Splunk, there's a lot of data to index, there's a lot of data to process. Um, and with our kind of full stack approach and our IO acceleration technology, well, these are real numbers that we've delivered to customers in terms of performance improvements. Now, when you have a performance improvement, we also drive greater efficiency, which means that you can run the workload on fewer nodes, smaller footprint, which then turns into TCO savings. 